The Carter Report presents Living Victoriously. Secrets of Success from Prime Minister Daniel of Babylon City with your host, John Carter. Welcome today to the Carter Report. This is part four of this great new series, Living Victoriously. And we give you a huge welcome today. We're just so glad to see you here in our studio. The topic is recovery from humiliation, insanity, and financial disaster. How to get back on top when the bottom falls out. Years ago, when Beverly and I were young people, we were sent in Australia to North Queensland. In Australia, as you go north, it gets hotter. And as you go south, it gets colder. So right down south in Australia, you have the Australian Alps, where you have a huge amount of snow in winter. Not much snow in summer, but you have a vast amount of snow where people go skiing in wintertime. But in the north, it's a land of water buffalo. Ever seen those things? Water buffalo weighs about a tonne. And also the biggest crocodiles in the world. We were sent to a town by the name of Mackay and we were running what was called in those days a mission. A mission is when you had a mission to do something great for God. I've heard people when I've come to America and they say they're running running an evangelistic campaign and they say they're running an effort. (laughs) My goodness. What are you doing? I'm running an effort. It's such an effort. To do that. We don't run efforts for God. Anything we do for God is a privilege and a pleasure. You know, uh, not doing an effort, but we were running a mission. And this beautiful couple with their children came along to the mission in the town of Mackay. Remember the town, Beverly? Our campaigns in those days were like the everlasting gospel. They went on and on and on. So a campaign that we would run in those days or a mission would last six months, twice a week. And we would visit everybody who came to the campaign at least 25 times. We just visited and visited and visited. And when I visited this home, I could see this young woman was having real, real mental difficulties. Uh, The whole family, they they were terribly concerned about her. She was a young mother and she had all the symptoms of a mental disorder. She was anxious, she was depressed, and worse than that, she was confused. The husband was just worried to death. I saw something happen there as a young minister that I'd never, ever seen before. As she started to read the Bible, and I teach people, read the Bible. I have a saying, read your Bible every day. If you don't read your Bible, you're not going to be strong. You're going to be weak. It's not enough to go to church. Sometimes going to church, listen to this, it can be bad for you. (laughs) If you don't hear the true gospel of Christ preached in church, and if you only get a lot of legalism or something like that, it's not going to be good for you. And so this young woman who'd never gone to church, she started coming to church and she started to read her Bible for the first time in her life. And uh, we said this to her. We want you to say this. I am a child of God. I am important. God has a plan for my life. So we said to her, look, don't give up. God hasn't given up on you because when the bottom falls out and, and you're down below the bottom, God is about to do something extraordinarily good for you. And we got her to read these great fat texts in the Bible, like Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 26 and onwards. And I want you please to turn with me in the scriptures to Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 26 and onwards, where the Bible says, Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. 
who brings out their hosts by number, talking about the stars. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my just claim is passed over by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall, this is great, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. As this young woman started to contemplate the greatness of God, God loves me. I'm a child of God. I am important. God has a plan and a purpose for my life. I am special in the sight of God. I am a child of the king. You know what happened to this young woman? She was completely healed. The healing took some months. But by the time the mission had come to a close, she was totally healed in her mind because she'd been filled with anxiety which had made her distraught. But God can heal people even when they're suffering from insanity. So many mental and emotional problems are caused by man's lostness. Listen to me, please. There are some great questions that you've got to ask and answer, such as, who am I? What am I? Am I a cosmic accident? That's what's taught in the universities. Where do I come from? Do I come from the slime, from some primordial sea? Am I the victim of blind chance? Where do I come from? Why am I here? Many people, even people who go to church, can't answer that question. They have no idea why they're here. Why am I here? Is this all an accident or do I have an appointment, appointment with God's divine destiny. Why am I here? And also, where am I going? Is life the end of existence? Is death the penalty for the crime of being born? See, if you can't answer those questions, you will go crazy. A philosophy in almost every university today and all the secular universities teaches this. This is true. Not what they teach, but it's true that they teach it. Man is the product of time plus matter plus chance. Man is the product of time plus matter plus chance. That's why the vast majority of evangelical Christian young people who go to universities who are not fortified with the truth lose their way. You see? So they need not religious propaganda. They need to know the truth. Man is the product of time plus matter plus chance. That is Darwinism. Albert Camus, a great philosopher, said this. Up till now, man derived his coherence from his creator. Our coherence, that which held us together, it came from our creator. But from the moment that he consecrates his rupture with him, he consecrates his rupture. We are ruptured from God and he celebrates it. He finds himself delivered over to the fleeting moment, to the passing days and to wasted sensibility. You want to understand the big problem in the world today? It's because man has not only lost his address, where he came from, where he belongs, 
that he's lost his own personal identity. And so he's given over to the moment of passing days and to wasted sensibility. You wonder what's wrong in America? Philip Adams in the Australian Weekend Review said this, We are as significant as the eighth billionth grain of sand beyond the final palm tree in the most distant oasis in the Sahara Desert. So what is man worth? If this is true, if man is the product of blind chance, then man is worth nothing. Now, you better listen to this because one day your children may have to face some things and if you don't have the answers, they never will. So listen up. The death of God always leads to the death of man. It has been said that God died in the 19th century and man died in the 20th. Now today we have the new insanity. It's based on these ideas. Nothing produced everything. That's what uh, Richard Dawkins, the great evolutionist uh, biologist from Oxford University teaches with a straight face. Nothing and millions, millions in America follow Richard Dawkins. Nothing, you know the biggest, fastest growing religious movement in North America beside the Muslims? Atheism. And most churches do not have the answer. They're talking about little sweet nothings. Nothing produced everything. Non-life produced life. Randomness produced fine-tuning. Non-reason produced reason. Chaos produced order. That is the doctrine of neo-Darwinism. Now... I could talk to you about this at length. Let me give you a tiny bit. The philosopher who most uh, influences Americans in their universities is Nietzsche. Frederick Nietzsche, who wrote the book, The Antichrist. I won't talk to you about it, but it's all based upon this and it produces this. Marx, who was a German Jew, embraced the teachings of Darwinism. He said, thank, not thank God, but thank goodness. Now we've got a scientific reason for communism. Hitler embraced the teachings of Nietzsche and slept with a copy of Der Antichrist under his pillow. You know that? This led to the greatest extinction of human beings in the history of the human race. A hundred million. I've been to places in Russia, I don't have time to talk to you about it, where tens of millions have been tortured to death because of this evil teaching, the new atheism produces the new insanity. That doesn't mean every atheist is crazy, but the teachings bring about craziness. It teaches the doctrine of meaninglessness. The greatest sickness of our times is not heart disease. It is not cancer. Those things can largely be prevented if we were smart enough to eat right. The greatest sickness of our times is meaninglessness which explains, of course, why there are so many suicides in Hollywood. Now today, we're going to consider the story of a very powerful and wealthy man. He went crazy, went insane, who lived out in the wilderness by himself for seven years, who acted like an animal, and who came back and got it all back, plus some. He was the original comeback kid. 
The most amazing story in the Bible is found in Daniel chapter 4. And I want you to turn to the text. Daniel, please turn to the text in the studio. Daniel, overcome spiritual sloth. Look up the text. Daniel 4 verses 1 and onwards. Nebuchadnezzar the king to all peoples, nations and languages that dwell on all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. Um, This story, of course, is historically correct. I've had a fair bit to do with biblical archaeology. I don't believe in the nonsense that's propounded by very ignorant people that you can't believe the stories of the Bible. I believe the stories of the Bible, especially the stories of Daniel. We know that Belshazzar was as real as any person today. We know that Nebuchadnezzar was. I've seen the cuneiform inscriptions with his name written on them. So we're not dealing here with just a made-up story. This is a chapter out of the book called... The rich and the famous. Have you seen it on television? Nebuchadnezzar was a billionaire, one of the world's greatest egotists. He was like Saddam Hussein. I've been to Iraq on a few occasions and I know a bit about this guy who considered himself to be the new Nebuchadnezzar. So when I went there, there were these vast billboards, and on one side it showed Nebuchadnezzar and on the other side it showed Saddam. He was a great, great egotist. Was Saddam like Nebuchadnezzar? But remember the old saying my mother taught me, pride goes before a fall. And she also taught me about Humpty Dumpty who sat on a wall. And Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. But I've got news for you today. God, yes, God can put, oh, God (laughs) can put Humpty together again. So if you feel like a Humpty, <laughs> there's, hope, there's hope for you. Uh, many years ago, people were talking about the doctrine of the second chance. Uh, is God going to give sinners a second chance? Well, I've got news. I believe in the doctrine of the second chance. I believe in the God of the second chance and uh, the third chance and uh, the fourth chance. It is simply called grace. Would you come over here to Romans chapter 5 and verse 20? The God of the second, the third, and the fourth, and the fifth chance. But don't die before it happens. Romans chapter 5, moreover the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, Grace abounded much more. Mm -hmm. This is a great truth. The great God of the Bible is the God of grace. The Bible says, where sin did abound. In the King James Version, which gives it a little bit better, it says, grace did much more abound. That's good news for us because none of us deserve to get to heaven. None of us. We've all (laughs) been like Humpty. Uh, But God is a gracious God. Much more abound. 
The God we serve is the God of much more. This is good, isn't it? God is much more. He's much more love, much more grace, much more mercy, much more forgiveness, much more power. It has been said that there are two great truths that we need to learn. Number one, man is much worse than he ever feared to think. Number two, God is much better than he ever dared to hope. You see? So even though we are a part of a sinful uh, humanity, we believe in the God of much more, much more, much more grace. Now look at Daniel 4, verse 4. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 4. I got to move along a bit because you folks are getting me sidetracked. Daniel chapter 4, <laughs> verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. Like the song that I used to sing when I was a young guy, sitting on top of the world, looking over. He said, I'm rich, <laughs> I'm great, I'm powerful, I've got all this money. He was a great egotist. He did not realize that he was simply without the grace of God, animated mud on the way to dust. That's all of us. And should animated mud be proud? I'm sitting on top of the world. Look at verses 5 to 8. I saw a dream which made me afraid. The thoughts of my bed and the visions of my head uh, trouble me. Therefore, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. But at last Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. In him is the spirit of the holy God. And I told the dream before him, and we will pick that up in a moment. He had a dream. He had a dream that told the history of his own petty, wealthy little life. Now pick it up now with me, verses 9 to 18. Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you, and no secret troubles you. Explain to me the visions of my dream that I've seen and its interpretation. These were the visions of my hand, of my head, while on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth. Its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heaven dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher. A holy one, coming down from heaven, he cried aloud and said, Chop down the tree and cut off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and the roots in the earth. Bound with a band of vine and bronze in the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Let him graze with the beasts of the, on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed 
from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast. And let seven times pass over him. This decision is by decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever he will and sets over it the lowest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have, I have seen it. But you, Belteshazzar, declare its interpretation since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation. But you are able for the spirit of the holy God is in you. What on earth does it mean? Here is a great tree planted by the river. And the birds fly through the branches. And the monkeys swing on the limbs. And the animals graze on the grass down below. What does it mean? We will tell you. After we have this little break, we'll be back. Hello, friend. I'm John Carter. By the grace of God, I'm going back to Russia. I've been to the lands of the old Soviet Union 47 times. <laughs> That's in the last 25, 26 years. We're planning to go to the city of Nizhny Novgorod, or the old Rus Russian city of Gorky, made famous by the poet Gorky. We're going there because 25 years ago, we ran a great campaign in Nizhny Novgorod, and we saw 2,530 souls, 2,530 Russians, communists, atheists, all sorts of unbelief, baptized into Christ in the Volga River. We're going back because the need is enormous and because the Russians are saying, please come and help us. Freedom is disappearing in Putin's Russia. It's almost impossible now to hire an auditorium, almost impossible to preach the gospel. And so, by the grace of God, we are applying for special missionary visas. Are we going to get them? We think so, by the grace of God. And we're going to advertise, by the grace of God, on television and on radio. Please write to me. I've got to raise $250,000 now. Please write to me, John Carter, Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358 in Australia, right to the address now appearing on the screen. This could be Russia's last opportunity. Please write to me. I ask you, in the name of God, write to me today and pray for Russia. Thank you and God bless you. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.